says here in King James, where there is no vision, the people perish. And we'll just stop right there. Um, Greg, what were you saying? Who said something with me on that? I'm going to pray. I'm going to share with, what you shared with me then. Yeah, um, I have a parallel King James and ID Bible. And um, those two scriptures, um, in the King James says, where well, there's no vision, the people perish. But in the, King, in the NIV, it says, where there's no revelation, the people shall cast off restraint. And I thought, you know, usually in parallels, there's something similar in Scripture. But this one seems so contrasting. I'm like, what in the world? So I started looking it up, and it actually does come out where there's no revelation. The people will cast off restraint. And the Lord is showing me that. But there's no vision or revelation of Christ in their life. Um, and this pertains to believers, not sinners. We cast off the restraints of the Lord in our life. And he cannot guide or, you know, really use this because we're off having, you know, visions or whatever, you know. Amen. Amen. All right, let's talk about leadership in relationship to uh, motivation. Responsibilities or duties that a leader has is in motivating people. Now, the truth is, is that if everybody had vision and had really seen the Lord in the manner in which we're speaking, if everybody um, had a calling and found that calling, if everybody was walking in the burden that they have, would we still need leadership? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the Bible has it all the way through. And right after the book of Revelation, you still have 24 elders, which is, you know, I mean, I mean I'm thinking Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God's on the throne. Why do we need 24 elders? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Not right now, but I mean, several years back, a few years ago. Like when I was a Jesus freak. <laughs> what are these guys doing there? All we need is Jesus. Yeah. But there they are. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you know, and of course, you're, you're also the one that says, "I believe the Word of God, every word of it." <laughs> <laughs> So what you do is you have to start adjusting to what the scripture says instead of twisting it to say what you want it to say. Amen? Um, and you know you can twist the scriptures to say anything you want. <laughs> so the goal would be, uh, no, Lord, I don't want to conform you to my image. I want to conform to your image. That's the goal. That's what you're doing. That's what you're working for. And so, um, so this thing of of leading or motivating people, part of the reason is, though, is that everyone has not come to a revelation of Christ. Um, I have worked with people for years and years and years and years that they felt the calling. Remember we had the calling up here, the burden the calling. They felt the burden and the calling, but they never came to the, really to see the vision. And because they didn't, they would go for a period of time and then, like a car, break down. And it would be like you'd almost have to reassemble the vehicle. I'm just going, okay, you know, and I mean, I'm thinking nobody's reassembling my vehicle. But I mean, you have to reassemble the vehicle and get it in there and pedal it and get it, and get down the road again and they break down, you know. And I was just thinking, you know, Lord, they really need to get this on the inside of them. And that's the difference between a gas engine and a nuclear engine. You know? I mean, you got something that's just going and going and going and going and going and going and going because it is, as Mallory shared, it's eternal in the heavens. It's working and manifesting itself in the earth. And it's, it's bringing glory to God through you, but apart from you, in a very real way. I mean, it's through you, but apart from you. say, well, how can it be apart from you then? 
because it's not you. But it's through you, and it is this it is this living vision. It is, and that remember we talked about that before. We, uh, you know, we all want to go out and witness. There's no such thing. You must become a witness. You don't go witness. You become a witness. You witness something. You've seen something. And in seeing, then you tell that which we have seen and heard and we speak and do. So that's what begins to work in you. And so, but when you, but, but, but then you've got all sorts of different kinds of people with all sorts of different kinds of backgrounds. And with that, um, there is, if you're some kind of a leader, depending on what, um, I mean, it really doesn't matter, whatever level you're on, if you have people underneath you, and when I say underneath you, that's not the best way of putting it, because in truth, you're serving them. But just to help you understand, if, if there are people that you are responsible for, you must motivate those people from time to time. That's a big part of leadership, is motivating people. Motivating people. And that can become hard when people have not seen the vision, or they don't realize the calling, or they realize it, but they don't feel like it. And so your ministry or your calling isn't going to go very far unless you can motivate people. Amen? Ah, but here's where you, you divide, you make a decision whether your ministry is going to be of God or man when it comes to how and what methods you use to motivate people. It becomes everything. It becomes everything. There are all sorts of different things that we can do to motivate people. You can manipulate them. Right? There's all sorts of ways of manipulating them. And you can you can dangle in front of them the things that they want. If you'll get out of bed and clean your room, I'll let you, you know, stay out an extra hour or so basically, what are you doing? You're feeding their flesh. And you're motivating their flesh. Because they have greed, or they have covetousness, or they have something within them that wants something that is of the flesh. Uh, and it can be anything from they want to be a success. That's feeding their pride. You're, there's all sorts of things. And so you're, you know, you're looking at that, and you're, you're dealing with them, and you're doing it to the glory of God. You know what I mean? It's not like you're manipulating them for your purposes. You're manipulating them for the, for the Lord to get them to do what God wants them to do. But can you see how wrong that is? Because even if they do it, they haven't done it. Because they, God is not, remember the scripture we read last, not last time, but one of the other classes? Man looketh on the heart, or on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. And he's looking, he's not, he's not caring what you do. Two shall be grinding, one take it. Two shall be in bed, one take it. It's not doing the right thing because, you, you know, it's the motivation that's going on. Why are you doing what you're doing? Not just do the right thing. You know, you know, do the right thing. Do the right thing and be evil on the inside. Or not evil, but I mean, certainly self-motivated. You know, the example I've given over and over is, is two doctors. You know, one doctor, he is, uh, they're, they're both going through school. They're both staying up late at night studying. They're both spending money to get through school. And they both finally graduate. And one gets out there and he wants to help people. And he wants to touch lives. And he wants to see sick people get better. He wants to see mothers have babies and be happy. And he wants to, the other one, he wants to drive a Mercedes. And he wants to live in a nice house. And he wants to be called doctor. And he, see what I mean? And one of them may have had something happen, several somethings when they were growing up where they were not respected, where people didn't show them honor and stuff. And so they said, well, I'll show them, you know, their father or their mother or some teacher or something. I'll show them I'll become somebody respectable. And I'll just, I'll just be honest with you, I was raised in an orphanage. And when I came to the Lord, you know, for the first time in my life, I was right. I was the black sheep of my family, and we lived in Eau Claire, so how black can you get? 
I mean, I was the black sheep of my family, and, and I was in trouble. And I, man, you cannot imagine the job. And so when I came to the Lord, it was like a whole new thing came in me, because, I mean, everybody looked down their nose at me, and I was the bad guy. And all of a sudden now, I'm wearing the white hat. You know? And this is making me feel something that I didn't feel before. Well, you know. And all of a sudden I began to realize this, the Lord didn't do this to make you something. To glorify His Son. And, and so I, I began to see motivations in me that were not the Lord. Why? I was, that wasn't the only reason why I was pursuing the Lord. I really, really found the Lord and I really, really loved the Lord and I continued to follow Him for that. But I had to drop off a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's good that you do because sometimes you'll be respected and sometimes you'll be hated. Look at Daniel. I mean, he was raised, you know, way up there and then other times he's down and out and he's in the lion's den. You know, it's all this, this back and forth thing. If you're serving God, it doesn't matter what your circumstance. Right? Amen? It doesn't matter if people look, give you respect or, or disrespect you. You're doing what you're doing for the Lord. Amen. And so you cannot stop. You will not stop. And no circumstance is going to stop the living reality, the motivation of life that is working in you. Okay? So, you don't turn around and then start trying to manipulate people and you know and again I remember you know and well you know but you know we're getting them to do what God wants you know well we're going to we're going to have an evangelism thing and so you start working on people and saying well you know and you, you're you're motivating them by other means um, uh, how about flattery. from the job. Why are you saying that about me? Because you're so good. Well, maybe the best person for the job is somebody who's not good at it at all. Could that be? Yeah, it could be. You know? And so there's, you know, there are scriptures that says do good to, you know, your brothers and da 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 that sort of thing. But flattery, folks, that's one of the strong, powerful motivations that in the book of Revelation it says Antichrist uses. Flattery? And so you find yourself, well, I gotta, you know, well, you really, da da da, and you say all this stuff, and you get them prepped, and you get them primed, and you get them proud. And then they go do for God what they wouldn't do had you not headed their flesh. So, with this kind of thinking, it would almost be better to say, well, I've just seen nothing happen than have a bunch of prideful people do this stuff. <laughs> Is that right or wrong? Now, if, you're, if you choose to go that route in your ministry, you're probably going to have lots of problems. The best thing to do is find people's area in their flesh that motivates them and use it and get them moving out for God. That's what most evangelists and teachers teach. And I say, that's not right. I say the best thing to do is preach Christ, try to motivate them by life, and if life don't motivate them, they won't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But you'll end up with a small group of people and, you know, you know, we can have the biggest, best church in the community. If you'll give when uh, the name of our church is mentioned, everybody will want to come to our church. And if we build the best building and make it look really good and everything, well, that will make people say, well, I want to be identified with that church. You may see anything wrong with that? Yeah. Jesus was born in a barn. Those kind of people would walk right out and say, the Son of God's in there, and they go, well, forget that. They either say, hey, I, you know, I'm too good for this, or... You know, no, sorry. God would only have the best. He would not the the God of all creation and of the universe that made the most beautiful places in Hawaii and the most beautiful Grand Canyon would not have his only begotten son born in a barn. Well, 
be wrong. He was. And if you're looking for the fancy place, then you're going to walk right past him and never even realize it. Why? Your motivations are wrong. Amen? So we're appealing to things, and it works. It, it gets people motivated, folks. People will give big money to, to bolster their pride. I mean, their name's in this, too. I mean, this is the church I go to. So they'll get behind it, and, you know, big, rich, money people are going, yeah, yeah, let's just build the best and the best looking and everything, and, and you know, and, and we will have pride in our community. I was talking with Mike Gentry about this the other day. You know, the original church in the Bible was not a respected organization. Did you know that? It was not respectable. They were considered a bunch of renegades. Uh, and we were talking about the scripture that says, uh, avoid all appearance of evil, which really in the original says avoid all kinds of evil. Because if you avoided all appearances of evil, Jesus wouldn't let that prostitute sit at his feet crying and wipe his hair his head. He would say, woman, get up from there. My God, you're, you're giving a bad name to me and the church. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And he wouldn't have hung out with sinners. I mean, he led Levi to the Lord. And he throws a party. And the only people that can come is tax collectors and Romans and, and traitor tax collectors that are Jews working for the Roman government throws a party and Jesus goes. Jesus goes to this party. And the Pharisees, of course, they don't go. Well, they do go. They go just enough to see Jesus in the party and condemn him. <laughs> you know, he's in there and he's rubbed shoulders with sinners. You know, that's not avoiding all appearance of evil. That's not respectable. The church in the first century during the time the Bible was written was not respectable. And so the, the first church was very pure compared to our church in other days. Because you weren't appealing. I mean, if you join this church like Stephen, you might die. If you join the church, you would be thought as somebody who left your father's teaching and your family and everything. You left Judaism and you are a failure and a bad person. You ever think of it like that? See, nowadays you say, look, I mean, when I got saved, I went, look, I'm actually a good person now. Of course, I wasn't. Jesus is, there's none good but God. So, you get my point? There are motivations that we're motivating people with, and we're trying to become an acceptable institution in the world. Jesus said, love not the world. Love the world shouldn't be upon you, da, 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 and this and that, and everything. And so, what do we do? We ignore that, and we use motivations to reach people. You know, we had a big church here for years and years and years, not very far from us, not in Denton, but in Carrollton, real close. And man, they had a phone bank and hundreds and hundreds would come to the Lord every day and all this kind of stuff. And, and of course, the, the deal was, you know, come get saved and learn these teachings and you'll be a great success. And you'll have the most wealthy business and you'll drive the best cars. And so people say, oh, I want to receive that Jesus. Well, did they receive the one who was born in a barn? The one that was willing to die for us and wants us to be in his image? Let this mind be in you. What mind are we talking about? The gold crust encrusted mind. No. <laughs> you know? But this mind of being made as a servant, made like a man, you know, uh, humbling yourself, even under death, becoming obedient under death. That's the mind. It's the mind of Christ. It's not a, it may be a shame to the world, but it's not a shame to those who know the land. It's not a shame to those who love the land. It's only a shame to those who are seeking reputation or something else in this world. So, you know, flattery is one of them. I mean, you know, you can get right down to force. Yeah. I mean, 
there's different versions of this. I mean, you know, I mean, you don't normally see somebody walking over and grabbing your arm and going, you're going to do it all right. <laughs> but there are actually churches that have done that before. You know, they have people walk in the aisle and you fall asleep and hit you on the head or something. <laughs> yep. That's right. There are places like that. You know? And they say, you're, you know, you slacker. <laughs> Sluggard? That's what the Bible says. You sluggard? Awake, thou sluggard! What? <laughs> you know, maybe we need that. Right? <laughs> I feel the calling. <laughs> what do you do if you're walking the aisles kind of going like this?
it's large compared to what we five, six dollars. <laughs> <laughs>
do you have a virus? Do you want me to kill it? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's gone. So that virus is gone. You know. And it's always checking and pulling stuff up. Well, our example that we use is that we need Norton working on the inside. It's called the Holy Spirit. Working constantly, always on in the background. It works on I mean, you're you're here on the screen working, but Norton's working in the background. Isn't that cool? It's working in the background, picking up if there's something wrong. And so you lay out and you say, you know, why did I do that? Well, I did it because of Jesus. I did it because I love that person. I did it because I wanted to be seen of you. I'm telling you, it's not, this is not fun. Amen. But it's it's good. It's right. It's a good foundation to work on. Really, it is. I, I hate it to this day. Because I'm, I'm sometimes surprised. I mean, I go, oh my God, what's that going on there? Oh my God. I thought oh, we dealt with this one. You know? But there it is, you know. And so you say, Lord, I want that in there. And because let me just say that most of what we do is a mix. There's a mixture. A lot of what we do is the Lord, and mixed in there is something for self, or could be the enemy, or other things, okay? So the goal is, and then here's what we do. We say it's either black or white, good or bad. Well, what if it's this mix of the Lord and flesh, and maybe a little bit of demons, and, you know what I mean, something like that. What if it's this mix, and you'll just take the whole thing and throw it out? Well, I just won't do that thing. Well, what if the Lord wants you to do it, but do it for the right reasons? Mm -hmm. Then what are you going to do? Well, then, the only way to do that is to take that mix and begin to pull out, lay it out there, make it clear, okay, there was motivation of the Lord, but there was this, and I'm not going to go by that. I'm going to do what I do for the Lord. And so while you were a motivation when I initially made this decision, boom, you are no longer a motivation I do what I do for Jesus Christ. And then you go charging forward because you know it's the will of God and now you're doing it in the spirit of God. So, and so, it's a tough deal, but it's a great deal. And I really, I'm going to just be honest with you, I find very few people who are always checking their motivations. I, I know everybody does from time to time. I mean, very few that are just just regularly, I mean, it's like work, you're talking about working in the background, but in a sense, you've got good, something going on, but you're laying stuff out there, and you're going, okay, well, sometimes you're not even sure. You say, Lord, help me see that a little clearer. And he begins to identify, but you, you have to, motivation is huge. Motivation comes from the heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. So it's huge. It's huge. And I'm not even, you can forget leadership, just living life. Yeah. Just living for the Lord. Yes? Um, something a little simpler about like the Lord, like when we, when the Lord showed us that, and we prayed that the Holy Spirit would bring that up. Um, like in computers, most people may be able to understand more. Like if you accidentally exit a program and you forgot to save it, a screen will come up and say, do you, do you want to save? You can't go any further until so you choose. And so that's what we pray is that the Holy Spirit will bring up that motivation and it will show us. And you have to go, yes, I want to go with this, or no, I don't. And you, by will, an act of your will, either choose to manipulate or choose to go with the devil, or you can go cancel. No, I don't choose this, or whatever. But but that's how we pray. Lord, bring this screen up every time that I cannot proceed any part of it. Because it's true. When you extra program and you forgot to save it, it will bring it up without fail. Every single time. And so you have to choose. And if you're all clear, then it's not going to bring it up. But if you're not in the clear, that screen will come up. And then you then the Lord's giving you a chance. Do you want to choose me? Or do you not want to? And that's how we pray. And the Lord has been faithful to bring that screen up on a regular basis. Because it's hard. Our mind's not going to remember a check. Right. The Holy Spirit. Do you choose to manipulate and have your way, or do you want to exit this program? You know, you choose to manipulate, have your way, run over the top of people, uh, deceive yourself, lie to others, or would you like to exit this program? You can ask the Holy Spirit to fill in the whole thing until you go, oh my God, no, I don't choose. You know what I mean? When it just blatantly puts it like that, oh, okay, this is, I'm going with you, Lord. 
challenge. It usually reads, do you choose to possibly go this way or go this way? You can go to get it. You know what I mean? We're, we're, there's, it's so cloudy and unclear, it makes it easy for us to choose the wrong thing. But if we can ask the Holy Spirit, bring it up and tell it like it is. You, are you going to persist in manipulating and using wrong motivations here? Or exit this program? Lord, I think I'm going to exit this program. It's gone. So that's probably a good note to close on. Huh? Can you pray over that? Is that good? Father, we just, we, we don't want to just learn subject matter pertaining to leadership. We want the real deal, and we want life, and even if this had nothing to do with leadership, Lord, we want to order our lives uh, according to your word and your way. We want to guard our heart with all diligence, guard our motivations with all diligence. And so, Lord, we ask you to not let us self-deceive, not let the enemy deceive us, but Lord, bring up, before that decision is made, bring up a screen and give us choice. And Lord, help it to be worded in such a manner that we can see it for what it is. And we can, if we truly just want to go with our flesh, then let us choose that. But Lord, it's better that we're just flat and making decisions. Lord, you said it's better to be hot or cold, not lukewarm. And so it's better, Lord, that we just flat say, no, I don't want to go with you, than to be deceived and think we're going with you. So, Lord, help us to see clearly and then go beyond that by the life and nature of your Son. Help us to choose regularly your life, your motivations, your ways, your kingdom above ours. Father, release that upon all of us here as we seek you. <coughs> Lord, we don't want to leave this classroom the way we came in. Yes. We want a new step in our walk. We want progress. We want forward yes. progress. Yes. Yes. And we want to be clear as to our walk. Not self yes, So we truly from our heart ask these things. Yes, Lord. And we, we now, by faith, believe that you have released us toward us. Thank you, Jesus. And we want to thank you, Lord. We want to tell you we have faith in you and we don't believe you brought these things up for no reason. But rather you brought them up clearly to help us. Cleanse us. You brought them up not because you hate us or you see darkness in us. You've always seen what is in us, but you brought it up because you love us and you care about us and you're drawing us nearer and nearer to your heart. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for persisting even against our own rebellions. And we go out of here with greater trust that you are at work in our lives to bring forth Christ and increase where he must increase and we will decrease. In Jesus' name.